So much media, so little time. Who keeps track of it all? That would be me. This is Bob Andelman, and this is the Mr. Media Interview, recorded live on blogtalkradio.com from the new media and American League Baseball capital of the world, St. Petersburg, Florida. Cartoonist Basil Wolverton was known for his grotesque drawings, fantastically odd creatures, spaghetti-like hair, smoothly sculpted caricatures, and insanely detailed crosshatching. His career in the golden age of comic books lasted from 1938 until 1952, after which his illustrations and caricatures extended into such publications as Life, Pageant, and Mad Magazines. Stylistically, he's been regarded as one of the spiritual grandfathers of underground and comics. Less well-known and understood is his work for the Worldwide Church of God, headed until 1986 by Radio Evangelist Strong. From 1953 through 74, Wolverton, a deeply religious man, was commissioned and later employed by the church to write and illustrate a narrative of the Old Testament, including over 550 illustrations, some 20 apocalyptic illustrations inspired by the Book of Revelations, and dozens of cartoons and humorous illustrations for various worldwide church publications. Compiled and edited by Wolverton's son, Mon- the 304-page Wolverton Bible includes all of Wolverton's artwork for the Worldwide Church of God Corporation. Monty delivers commentary and background introduction and an each sentence. Many of the illustrations in the book are regarded as Basil Wolverton's finest work. Still others have never been published, and some of the humorous drawings printed here rival Wolverton's work in Mad Magazine. I, uh, now I, I, much of that has come from uh, press materials for the book, but I want to add before I bring Monty on that I grew up in the 60s and the early 70s and would see the work of, of Basil Wolverton and different places uh, on, on trading cards and in the magazines and mad plop magazine was a big favorite of mine. And I was always just in, in awe uh, of this man's work. And I never knew anything about him until the Wolverton Bible was put in my hands a few weeks ago. And uh, it's just very, very cool. So uh, now I want to uh, welcome uh, Monty Wolverton to Mr. Media. Monty, welcome. Thank you, Bob. It's a it's a, a pleasure to have you here. I, I have to tell you, uh, it's seeing pictures of your dad uh, in the book after all these years of admiring his illustrations was was quite an interesting moment. Yeah, um, and and when you when you saw the picture, what did you think? Well, that was it. I, I'm glad you asked me. Thank you. <laughs> I thought. I thought, holy cow, he's a regular-looking guy. He's a dad, and I, I, I'm guessing maybe a grandfather, and he looks like a grandfather. I mean, it's just, uh, you know, you think he's going to look like, I don't know, Ted Kaczynski or something. <laughs> right, yeah, he was, he was quite a socially uh, conservative person. Um, he, he was apolitical, uh, but uh, uh, in contrast to his, to his work, um, he, was, he was rather socially conservative. Interesting, and, and I think um, uh, I, I'm probably skipping ahead. Uh, the first underground comic, I think it was a, a copy of Zap that he saw. He was uh, he was quite uh, quite taken aback, um, even though he had had an influence on a lot of these a lot of these artists, a stylistic influence. But he was he was just uh, he was just incredulous. Uh, but I think uh, that that reflects, uh, you know, an earlier style, an earlier um, uh, culture. Did he? Uh, I, I, let's let's follow that for a minute. I mean, how did he feel about um, about the underground comics? I mean, you, as you say, I mean, you could pick up most any underground comic and think that you would see a, a direct line from from uh, Basil to to some of these guys. But I suspect. Uh, as 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 I know, Will Will Eisner was the first time he saw this stuff. It's like it's one thing to to think that you're you know uh, doing a certain style, and then to see it it not bastardized, but go in a completely different direction. It's got to be quite a a moment. Well, I think it was. Uh, you know, when the underground comic uh, movement began to emerge, um, at the same time, interest in his work picked up from in my father's work from from a new generation of uh, artists and cartoonists. And I think he was kind of flattered by that. 
uh, people started, uh, you know, he, he had stacks of, of art stored away in his closet. Um, he felt uh, in the early 70s that uh, conditions in the world were, were going downhill. Uh, he said once, you know, when, when the economy collapses, looking back to the, to, the, uh, to the Depression, which he lived through, he said, you know, comics are going to be the first thing to go. He had, a, he had three stacks, I remember, of, of uh, Golden Age comics, two or three feet high in his closet that I went through. And uh, somebody told him, wow, you know, some of these things are worth as much as 50 bucks. This was in the <laughs> early 70s. <laughs> and he thought, fifty bucks? That's that's outrageous. So he said, I, you know, I've got to sell these off because they're, you know, the time has come to sell these things off. <laughs> so he uh, uh, sold a, a good part of his collection of his own work then, in his comic collection. And um, uh, the reason he was selling it was because there was, to some degree, was because there was interest in his work generated. Uh, to some degree, by the by, the underground artists. Mm -hmm. But I don't think he understood at that point, you know, exactly what the underground movement entailed. <laughs> until uh, he was down here visiting us in the in the uh, early 70s when we lived in Los Angeles and he lived in in uh, the Portland, Oregon area. And uh, Robert Williams came over to visit him and uh, took him for a ride in in one of his. Uh, one of his cars, one of his customized cars, a uh, uh, a ride down Colorado Boulevard that my father described as as a white knuckle sort of an experience, <laughs> and uh, uh, Robert was much younger then, of course, and then Robert uh, gave him a little stack of of Zap comics, and uh, and he graciously accepted the Zap comics, and. Uh, Afterwards, he, he looked at him, and then you know there was the work of S. Clay Wilson and Robert Crumb and all this <laughs> stuff in there. And he thought, well, I don't know what he thought. Holy crap! He probably didn't think that, but but uh, uh, he you know ripped them up into little pieces and put them in a in a trash can. <laughs> I've, related, I've related this story to to Robert since then, uh, uh -huh. but I think you know he under, he understood that uh, my dad was coming from a from a different age. And uh, and this just completely blindsided him. So, um, but on the same at the same time he was he was flattered by by people who would emulate his work stylistically. And when he was later on when he had a stroke, Robert uh, sent him several beautiful uh, custom get well cards that I still have in my files here. Hmm. It's funny you mentioned S. Clay Wilson. I. Uh... I think people who listen to the show often uh, often know that know this, and I, I think we've discussed this via email. But I I wrote uh, Will Eisner's biography, and one of the stories that he had told me was uh, that the first time that he met uh, uh, Dennis Kitchen, who was an underground publisher and later became his agent, and also by coincidence Art Spiegelman, uh, mm -hmm. famous artist as well, um, was at a comic book convention in New York. Uh, I don't know about 1970, I guess, and. Uh, Dennis wanted to show him uh, his uh, the kitchen sink publications, and they had gone to a dealer's table. I, guess, I think it was Phil Suling's table, and it had uh, all these underground comics, and Will just picked up the first one he saw, and it uh, it turned out to be S. Clay Wilson's. Um, it was uh, Captain Captain Piscums and the Pervert, uh, Pervert Pirates, something like that. I, I don't have it in front of me. And uh, he looked at it, and he blanched, and he suddenly put it down. <laughs> <laughs> and it was kind of like, okay, this is what it's all about, huh? I mean, it's. I remember that period of time, and you know, that was you picked those things up, and you didn't know what you were getting your hands on, and you, you could you could definitely be surprised. Exactly. Well, these guys were trying to you know break every possible taboo there was in the world, mm -hmm. and uh, that that was part of part of that movement, it was part of that yeah. that social uh, phenomenon. I mean, I, I'm guessing that as this book is, is getting circulated and people are having this opportunity to, to, to learn more about your dad, um, that probably a lot of people are surprised. Like I, I said, you know, I, was only, you know, I was only kidding, but, you know, you expected a guy who looked like Ted Kaczynski based on, based on these crazy, crazy characters that he created all these years and that have remained in circulation because they are so unique and so bizarre and they're just so funny. That you know, to see a guy 
who, you know, just looks like your grandfather. I mean, obviously, you know, different from at different periods in, in his life, but you know, you can see he doesn't. He looks like a fairly conservative guy, you know, uh, probably a good neighbor and a good friend. But uh, it just, I mean, it's got to be. Was it, was it ever difficult? Well, I guess what I'm wondering is, as a kid, when did you discover what he did, and and how did you respond? I well, it took me it took me a while to uh, figure out that. You know, there was something different there. Well, I grew up with my dad as a, as a cartoonist. You know, my dad was worked for Mad Magazine, and my friends in school knew that. And, you know, so they bugged me to, uh, I, you know, drew little T-shirts, uh, Ed Roth-style T-shirts, because that's sort of what they associated my dad's work with. Mm. I, would, I would draw these T-shirts and uh, sell them to, to people. I guess it was my first professional uh, uh, cartoonist was sort of loosely connected with, with my father's uh, work. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I grew up with it. Oh, okay. Now I'm, I'm thinking of something. Okay. Many, many years later, which is a good thing, you know, to occasionally think <laughs> of something. Uh, <laughs> years later, and it's related to this book, uh, this is probably about 10 Ten years ago, after mm-hmm. after my father had died and so forth, uh, I I was at a conference of the Worldwide Church of God. It was a pastors' conference. Um, I found myself in some kind of small group session. I can't remember the purpose of the small group, but a lot of pastors' wives there who were my age, uh, some of them younger, some of them older, were recalling their experiences with my father's work as, you know, members of the Worldwide Church of God. And uh, suddenly I was confronted by all these uh, people who had been traumatized by uh, these illustrations, by these horrible illustrations. Of... <laughs> and, oh uh, um, you know, I, I had one of those moments where you feel sort of disoriented, like mm-hmm. you're having an out-of-body experience. And this this can't really be happening, right? Because I I grew up with him and I didn't have a problem. Um, <laughs> I had the biggest problem I had with my dad's work was uh, this one illustration in Mad Number no. Eleven, um, the uh, series of Mad Readers that he did for people who are familiar with that, mm-hmm. um, where this old guy had a tack in his heel. That really bothered me, you know. All the other stuff and the little tack in the heel bothered. <laughs> The, uh, the you know, but I grew up with these Bible illustrations, people clawing at the at the ark, volcanoes, six hundred foot tidal waves. Yeah, cool, you know. Uh, but these people here were had been traumatized and had nightmares, and they were uh, they were saying that I should apologize for that. Well, you know, being a nice guy, I I sort of started to apologize, and I thought, wait a minute, why am I doing this? Uh, you know, does does, uh, does Boris Karloff's kid apologize for uh, people being scared by watching his movies, or you know, Bela Lugosi? Or no, that's ridiculous. You, you mm-hmm. take responsibility when you look at a piece of of art, and there's a lot of horrible stuff out there. I'm not saying my dad's stuff is horrific. I guess is the is the uh, is the word. So I think at that point, and I, gosh, that was only ten years ago. I realized what what kind of a powerful effect this had on some people you know it was almost like these people were going to have to go into therapy because you know they'd been scared by my dad's art or something i thought wow this is really strange will you will you and we should point out these are and and correct me if i'm wrong these were people who were upset by his biblical art right yes yeah yeah and, and, and we're going to, I want to get to that in a couple minutes. So that, I mean, that's pretty significant, but we, were you, I mean, growing up, did, did kids you, did kids you grew up with know about the other art that he did? You know, the stuff that uh, I started talking about, like the mad and the plop and I don't know how old you are exactly. I'm, I'm guessing we're, we're, they, we're not They knew far. him, uh, my, my friends in junior high school and high school knew him as a mad artist. Okay. Uh, they weren't really aware that he had done anything, uh, it, some of my close friends might have been aware that he did some Bible illustrations, but okay. uh, 
Did, but did I never they... had the opportunity to explain why he would be doing Mad Magazine and, and Bible illustrations at, in the same career, uh, nor did the question <laughs> arise. <laughs> I, I'm thinking that he must have had like two very separate groups of people that he knew, that they probably didn't mix a lot. Yes, you're, you're absolutely right. Church, he was, church people and, and uh, the people who were associated with, with his comic. Even when uh, at, his, at his funeral, you mentioned that, I, I remember this. After his funeral, we had uh, uh, a bunch of people over to the house. And in his, in his office, in his studio, were uh, concentrated, the, uh, this is back in 1978, all the, all the comic people were in there. Then out in another room were the relatives, you know. <laughs> My socialist uncle and and some other people, and, and then uh, then in yet another room were the people from the church. Then in yet another room were people who had been in the church and who had left the church uh, for one reason or another w- that the church people wouldn't talk to. So <laughs> I thought that was I thought that was quite funny. It, it's I mean it's fascinating. Now and he was. Uh, he was a cartoonist and a comic book artist uh, before the church came came along, as I, as I recall from reading. Yes, yes, he was. Um, he got his first uh, he got his first strip uh, published in nineteen thirty. Let me let me just check my uh, yeah nineteen thirty eight. This guy's a detective wow. in Space Hawks. Uh, he had tried to get uh, uh, newspaper strips published as early as, uh, well, he started submitting material to syndicates as uh, early as 15 or 16, when he was 15 or 16 years old. Mm-hmm. And his first uh, uh, national publication um, at the age of 16, which was a panel cartoon of a guy being a doctor guy sawing a guy in half. <laughs> so, you know, it started right from the beginning there. Hey. And, you know, I was just thinking, you also say in your introduction to the book, I think that, um, uh, and I know we're skipping around quite a bit, and people just have to learn to live with it, but uh, Herbert Armstrong, who he got involved with with the church, in, a, in I think in the mid-1940s, had said to him, you know, you should really get out of the comic stuff. That's going to go by the wayside and start focusing on, on other stuff. Um, I did not realize how early Herbert Armstrong had been sending that message to my dad until I did, you know, the research for this book. Mm. But, yeah, very early on, uh, Herbert discovered this, uh, or Mr. Armstrong, uh, if you will, discovered uh, this uh, professional fellow there who was interested uh, in, in his work, and uh, um, he thought that he could he could use him because basically the rest of his supporters at the time were... were uh, sort of uh, country folk uh, in Oregon and here was you know here was an up and coming professional guy that he could uh, he could sort of tap into and and uh, put him on his board of directors which he did uh, almost immediately so but at the same time he was sending him a message you know we can we can do other things together and and uh, uh, but he didn't for a long time he kept he kept working in comics and and Mr. Herbert Armstrong's uh, message to him was, you know, the comic industry is about to collapse because Herbert felt that uh, World War II was the uh, was basically the end of the world. Mm. It, it wasn't. So I've heard. Yeah. <laughs> uh, did, um, how would your dad? Uh, how would your dad explain to people what he did? Would he? I mean, I guess it would be, and, and would the answer be different at different stages of his career, or would it depend on who he talked to? I mean, would he say, I'm an arch of God, or would he say, I'm, I'm, a, I'm an illustrator for, you know, the comics? Which one, which one would he take the most pride in, in discussing and being, I taking think credit equally, for? I equally, toward the end of his life, he thought the best thing that he had done, the important and significant thing that he had done, had been the, the Bible story. Uh, but I think he also felt very good. He never regretted uh, anything that he'd done uh, of secular work. He felt like he was providing 
good entertainment for people. Hmm. Um, and and his later stuff, which got more and more farther out, if you you look at the plot covers and some of the stuff that he did for Topps Chewing Gum, uh, he was appealing to uh, what he thought the the young kids, the junior high school kids, wanted at the time. And he felt he felt good about that. Um, he felt like um, at the end of the day, after uh, eight hours or however long of, of working on the, the Bible story and doing relatively serious illustrations, that he could sit down and and uh, whip out some you know really strange thing for tops chewing gum with you know drool and zits and <laughs> and uh, all that kind of stuff. He felt like that was kind of his dessert. So. Uh, he, he never had a problem with it, and I, I think some people in the church may have questioned it, but they never really challenged him on it. Even mm. Herbert Armstrong didn't challenge him on it. Did uh, uh, Why was your dad drawn to the church in the first place? Uh, you, you indicate, I think, in the introduction, he, he did not start off as a terribly religious man. He, uh, his dad was a religious man. And at the age of 16, his, his dad would take him out to these, to these camp meetings. His, his mom was more convent, con, uh, conventional. She was, she was a Methodist. But his dad liked the, you know, the evangelistic camp meetings and stuff. So they'd trudge out to these camp meetings, tent meetings in the, in the country, and I think he, he got saved at uh, one of these meetings when he was about 16. Hmm. Uh, and if you look in his, in his journals, he's got one little journal where he had this crystal set, and he was trying to find out how many stations he could get in. He, he uh, mentioned that he, he got Amy Semple McPherson uh, down here at the Los Angeles station. Uh, KFSG, I think it, it was. And uh, he was all excited about that, you know, because she was preaching the gospel, yada, yada. And, um, uh, but then, uh, around the age of 16 or 17, uh, his dad uh, left home and abandoned the family. There was, there was some kind of... Um, he got into some situation where he was selling stock uh, that was a problem, uh, because it was fake, <laughs> oh. and uh, and the local uh-huh. city fathers either suggested that he leave town very quickly, or um, he felt the need to leave town very quickly. So hmm. he came home one day, um, uh, got on the bus, packed his bags, and left for Seattle. Um, then he came back and, and lived in Portland as my grandfather, but was mm-hmm. alienated from his family for reasons that I don't I don't know. He followed my dad's career and was uh, seemed to be proud of, of what his son had done. Mm-hmm. Um, but at that point, uh, my father became disillusioned with with religion and uh, was an agnostic or even an atheist for years. Um, he would listen to the radio when he when he would draw, and in the late 30s and early 40s, he. He uh, heard Herbert Armstrong on the radio, and, and I think uh, Herbert was talking about, um, oh, the proofs that God exists, or, or creation, or versus evolution, or something like that. And uh, my father became upset with it and engaged him in an argument. Could have been prophecy. I don't know. Anyway, uh, my father was not equipped to withstand uh, uh, Herbert's logic, whatever that whatever that might have been. So he uh, he became a follower, and um, and that's that's how that happened. Did they have a, uh, did they make a, a connection personally? I mean, did they enjoy each other's company or interaction? Uh, what, what was the relationship that they developed? Yes, they did. He he uh, Herbert was in uh, Eugene at the time, so he came up and visited my dad. Uh, he baptized him in the Columbia River, I think, in 1941, ordained him mm-hmm. minister in 1943, and somewhere around there put him on the, the uh, board of directors of, of his church. And my father pastored a small church there for mm-hmm. several years while he was uh, 
you know, drawing uh, Lena the hyena or whatever at night. <laughs> He would uh, go past her church. So there's all, yeah, yeah, there always is. It's, it's, a, it's a theme. It's sort of a dichotomy. But nobody, you know, nobody questioned it. My, my father didn't see a conflict. Wow. Um, I have. Um, we have a live uh, web chat that accompanies interviews, and it's, mm -hmm. I mean, it's been kind of interesting. There's two things going on here that'll be of interest to you. Uh, one is uh, that a, a gentleman named Harold Ryman or Riemann is in the chat and says that he went to school with you. Yes, yes, I remember him. We were we were uh, in uh, we we're in the same dorm together. Okay, yeah. where, where was that? That was Ambassador College, which was oh. uh, Herbert Armstrong's college here in Pasadena, California. Oh. Well, not here okay. in Pasadena, but forty miles away from me. Okay. Well, Harold says it's uh, good to hear a familiar voice, a voice from the past. So if, if you want to shout out a hello to him, he's there listening to the show right now. Hi, Harold. <laughs> good to see you uh, again. Well, I can't see you, but uh, I know you're there. I, I encouraged Harold in the uh, web chat to uh, call in and say hello. He, uh, he made a note here that we are coming to the end now, and me being focused on the interview thought he meant the end of the interview, but he said us, the, the world as we know it is coming to an end. So I thought maybe he might want to call in and say hello now while I had the chance. Um, okay. Yeah, a lot, of, uh, a lot of people tend to believe that. Yeah. And then uh, we have a, another uh, person here who has a completely different comment, question. Um, uh, Bishop Net News Weekly 2 says, I've tried, and this is a question for you as an artist, I think. Uh, I've tried Googling cartooning software and can't find any uh, where do I find cartooning software? Is Corel Draw, pardon me, is Corel Draw the only thing available? I'm not aware of any cartooning software. So, okay. Somebody probably is. Uh, the software that's most useful to me is uh, uh, Adobe Photoshop. Hmm. Um, so that's that's what I'd recommend. I use Adobe Photoshop and Quark Express. Uh, to uh, design and lay out my work, and then uh, and then do the inking on on top of that, and then take it back into into Photoshop and and uh, do adjustments and so forth, and send it out. I'm talking about my political cartoons now. Mm -hmm. And do you use a, a the, the Wacom device where you can draw right onto the screen? Yes, I do. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, a lot of other people, especially uh, editorial cartoonists, uh, do their political cartoons just completely electronically. Uh, mm. But no, I've got to I've got to feel the the ink on the pen at some point. So so I still draw, and then and then I might make adjustments afterwards. Okay. And I use the same uh, same paper my dad did, uh, two ply uh, Strathmore Bristol. <laughs> That's the traditional stuff. Yeah, and I and I use his. I have his drawing board here too. And as a matter of fact, I'm sitting in his chair. Wow. <laughs> so I don't know what that means, but uh, but it's here, so I use it. Was it a fait accompli that that you wound up uh, an, an illustrator yourself, a cartoonist? You know, I I uh, I always thought that I would do some kind of some kind of artwork. My dad built me a little drawing board when I was about ten years old, and and I drew a lot of things. But a lot of kids draw things. Um, did some cartooning in in uh, in high school and made giant illustrations to illust to uh, decorate for uh, dances and and so forth. But um, it wasn't until after after college, when I was working as a graphic designer and an art director, uh, and my dad had a, had a stroke, that I thought, hey, nobody else is doing this this style or or carrying the style on and making it evolve. So I started. I started drawing caricatures. Uh, drew a batch of stuff. This would have been about 1973. Uh, sent them out to different magazines and uh, started doing work for Peterson Publishing's Cartoons. If hmm. if anyone remembers sure. that, I do. Uh, <laughs> yeah, several several people do. Uh, <laughs> uh, Big Daddy Ed Roth was involved with that at some at some point in time, hmm. and. Uh, Several several great cartoonists there. So I did work for them. I did work for a magazine called Creative Computing, 
and uh, another CB radio magazine, and I had three or four things going on a, on a regular basis, plus stuff that I was doing for the, for the church. So, uh, so after a while, I felt like, like, uh, like I had enough work to freelance and did freelance for about eight years between 1977 and 1985. Hmm. And, and uh, I see that you, you, you yourself have also drawn for MAD. Yes, uh, that's that's kind of interesting. I don't. Well, you know, there's Mad is only quarterly anymore, and there's a whole new right. batch of guys uh, drawing for it, and, that, and that's great. But in the in the 90s and the early 2000s, um, I did about 13 or 14 things for them, which was actually more than my father did. My father did 10 items for Mad. To go back and count up the number of features that he did, hmm. he didn't do that many, but the work that he did was, you know, enormously influential, and a whole lot better than my work. You know, I've got to, oh. I've got to say that it was, you know, it was just, it was just incredible. And of course, they reprinted it again and again and again. <laughs> so, yeah. um, uh, so it's right that, uh, you know, he should be honored as one of the old, uh, the old mad artists, even though he was. You know, he was kind of not part of their 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 big stable of of uh, artists that were there. He was kind of this guy out on the on the west coast that they would use for an occasional feature because uh, you know they didn't want to have the magazine look too goofy or something to that effect. Mm. Well, his look, want. the look of his work was so. Uh, I mean, it just. I mean, Jack Davis has his look, and yeah. and uh, Don. Uh, Oh gosh, I can't think of Don's last name. All of a sudden, ah, uh, Don Martin drawing a blank. Don Martin, thank you. Yeah. I mean, they they all have a particular look, and and your dad is part of that. Now, and then while we're talking about your work, though, uh, are you still the uh, uh, ME for uh, Plain Truth magazine? I am, yes, managing editor for Plain Truth magazine. I was art director for uh, for a number of years. And then, uh, then it seemed like I got more and more and more into management. And uh, at one point, I had uh, uh, like 26, I think 26 people, designers, uh, uh, photographers, artists, and so forth, working for me. But I was I was pushing pencils. That, that would have been in the in the early 90s. Not push, pushing pencil. Not pushing pencil and drawing. <laughs> <laughs> Not really doing anything very, very uh, creative. So that was uh, that was an interesting period of of time. But uh, but I felt uh, a little frustrated there because I wasn't really cranking out any cartoons except for the occasional freelance job. In mm -hmm. um, uh, I think it was about 1996. Um, I couldn't stand it anymore because of you know certain political situations that were. That were happening. Not, not going to name any parties or anything. Uh, so I, ju I just started drawing political cartoons and posting them on my website. And uh, uh, a few years, a year or two went by, and, and Daryl Cagle uh, uh, said, "Hey, do you want to, you know, contribute to my to my syndicate?" I think it took him a few year, more years before he actually created a, a syndicate. And I said, "Well, yeah." So I've been doing that for uh, oh gosh, since 1996, mm. uh, and I I like that. I like political cartoons. Mm -hmm. It generates almost as much controversy as religion. <laughs> and how would you describe your politics on the spectrum? Uh, somewhere to the left. Okay. <laughs> 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 Way to the left. <laughs> Way to the left. Okay. And and it, it, I, I think that that's the influence of my uh, my socialist uncle, maybe. <laughs> um, uh, actually, in the uh, the web chat, Harold is now asking: if, Is there a Plain Truth magazine now? I know that there's a there's a website. Is there still a print magazine? Yes, there is. Yeah. Um, Plain Truth Ministries. Uh, Split off from the, or was created as a separate corporation in 1996 from the Worldwide Church of God. We have, we now have no uh, corporate connection with them. We're, you know, we're still friends with them, of course. But uh, uh, we published uh, 
the magazine since then. We we own the the trademark to it and so forth. Mm-hmm. So yeah, we're we're um, we're monthly a uh, bi monthly magazine. And uh, much much different than it was in the in the days of uh of Herbert Armstrong. Okay. So um how would your dad deal with the world today? How would he see things? I, you know, there there would be so many uh, changes that I think he would have had to navigate through uh, to get from where he was to uh, <laughs> hopefully the same place that that I'm at now. Mm-hmm. Um, I I think at some point he he probably would have uh, decided that that his his viewpoint about uh, uh, the coming uh, end of the world and so forth was was probably uh, misinformed. And uh, you know, as someone who lived through the depression, he he would probably be very anxious about uh, what was going on right now. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think, uh, actually, if he had a pen in his hand, I think his reaction to it would be to draw more cartoons, because that's what <laughs> cartoonists do, uh, to try to take to entertain people to take their their minds off this, and maybe I don't know, maybe write a few few articles. I think he'd try mm-hmm. to do something about it. I don't think he'd be really freaked out by it. Um, okay. So. Well, and let's let's come back to the art for a few minutes. We've got a couple minutes left here. Um, what's the secret? And I, I, there probably is no good answer for this, but I want to ask: What is the secret to the Basil Wolverton style? Um, the secret of creating it, or what makes it that style? Probably a little of both. I'm kind of curious if there's a secret to the execution. Of that style, I mean, it, I'm looking at it and I'm trying to figure out: Am I looking at a lot of zipatone in his style? Is it all? Is it all? Every you know, all the dots hand. You know what I mean? One one editor told him once: You know, I figured you out. You cover up your lack of talent with all those little lines. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a that's a good and if, one. And if there's if there's a secret, that that's it. And and my father, you know, sort of readily admitted that. That uh, as an artist uh, to you know sit down and draw things freehand, um, he, I you know I think he was good. He didn't think he was that good. He had mm. he had stacks and stacks of of work by uh, uh, Alex Raymond and uh, Hal Foster that he would go back to and use for anatomy. Mm. You know he didn't draw this stuff like a lot of comic artists are able to do, you know, right out of their, their head because they have such a such a wonderful handle on, on uh, human anatomy. But he had to, uh, you know, he had to really work at what he did. But then, I think over, over a period of time, especially when he got out of comics somewhat and more into a different style of art, he developed this style of cross-hatching and detail. Where did he get that? Um, the best source I can think of is perhaps Virgil Finlay, um, who, you know, is if you ever looked at his work from the old pulps, unfortunately, you know, when it was published in the old pulps, you couldn't see it, but it's just a wealth of, of cross-hatching and, and uh, pen and ink. And uh, he, would, he would, you know, put tremendous amounts of time into just, you know, a little cross-hatching and so forth to uh, not just put shading down, but to create the illusion of a three-dimensional sculpture. And that's kind of the, the key to his work. He was really, he was not drawing so much as he was sculpting. Mm-hmm. And so in the, in, the, in the, you know, in the really best Wolverton illustrations, you get this uh, feel of volume that's being these faces that are being stretched and pulled and, and distorted and, uh, you know, with big lumps and the feeling that you can reach out and grab them and, and touch them. Uh, everything everything in his art has thickness 
even the hair has has thickness, and uh, that's why one editor referred to him as the spaghetti and meatball because if you look at the way he executes hair, it's you know each strand looks like a piece of spaghetti. So over a period of time, he he evolved that style where everything was sort of tangible and had thickness. And of course, you know because I grew up with it, it's it's hard for me, or it was hard for me to to arrive at an objective view of it, but I, th- I think that's, that's, that's close. It's, uh, we, before the, the interview, you and I corresponded a little bit via email and, and I told you quite honestly that I, I just, I just even thinking about it now and opening the book while we're talking, I see, uh, now I'm not so much of a Bible person, but, but the, 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 the funnier stuff in the back and those crazy, I mean, it just brings such a smile to my face. And, and I remember how many times over the years that I have enjoyed uh, your dad's work that way. And but it's just to me, it's like a, it's it, the miracle is the style and the, the imagination that goes into this stuff. Um, did, I'm looking at, at some of the some of the stuff in the back here. And I think I mentioned this in the commentary that in the in the uh, in the late '60s and the '70s, as his 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 hand started to shake a little. Uh, you know, and he developed physical problems like like a lot of artists do. Um, the the style still comes through. In fact, it loosens up a little, and even though it might not be anatomically correct, it becomes a whole lot more expressive uh, to me, anyway. I don't know what mm-hmm. other people would say about it, uh, but that's the impression I got as I went over this whole body of work, and you could see see his evolution of of style. So in, in one way, he was incorporating his disability. Remember how Charles Schultz had this little shake to his line? Right. And he incorporated that right into his style. Somebody somebody told me once, uh, a, a big uh, New York Magazine illustrator, uh, who shall remain nameless because I can't remember his name, um, <laughs> that's, about a, half hour. That's, the best, that's the best reason. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He said, "Style is not so much a matter of, of your abilities, but it's a matter of uh, avoiding the things that you you uh, know you can't do. So the mm-hmm. remaining thing becomes your your style." And I, I told a couple of people that, and they said, "Well, that's not right. Why well, style is a?" You know, <laughs> I, I I think probably that's that's a pretty good uh, motivator for for style. If there's something you can't do real well, you avoid it. And right. so, what's left over becomes your style. Did Did you have any? Uh, I guess we'll kind of wind up here. But did you have any hesitation in in putting together this book in uh, uh, adding the funny stuff? At the back? I mean, because I mean, we go through the uh, all the illustrations of the Old Testament and the Book of Revelation, and then we get to a point where oh my God, it's been piled on, and there's all this horrific stuff that's supposed to happen, and you know, certainly uh, 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 Harold, Harold uh, in the web chat is expecting, you know, the end of times. Uh, and then you turn the page and there's stuff that's just going to make you out and out laugh between the, the, the illustration and, you know, the, what it says. I mean, it's just funny. Is it, is it, uh, it, was it at all? Did you hesitate to put that in there or did you, th- you know, think maybe this doesn't fit? But I well, think it's great. There, there is a little story behind that because originally I uh, – uh, the people at Worldwide Church, uh, Mike Fizel and Joseph Tkach, asked me, well, you know, what is it you want to, to do with this material? Because originally I had possession of, of all the artwork, but technically the artwork belonged to the church, so, so I had to give much of it back to them, the part that had been done uh, when my dad was an employee. Mm. So, you know, and that, that was not a problem. We all mutually agreed that that's what should should happen but they said well you know if you if you kept the artwork what did you want to do with it eventually and i said well eventually i'd like to put all the artwork into a single single volume and they said well why don't you do that and so that's how this this book uh, came about and we we talked to gary groff at fantagraphics and he said yeah this, this is an exciting uh, uh thing here but but initially i thought let's just do the the bible stuff and uh, I think I had gotten most of that together and showed it to uh, people at the Worldwide Church. And they said, well, well, where's all the funny stuff? And I said, well, you know, it kind of that's just what you said. 
it kind of doesn't fit. And uh, and they said, oh no, no, you got to you got to have the funny stuff in there. That's, you know, <laughs> that's the best stuff. <laughs> Isn't that funny? I thought, well, you know, okay. So so I went back and added a whole uh, whole chapter at the end of of that. I was really glad that I did because yeah. that's that's a much better um, uh, that 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 shows the dichotomy that is was inherent within his uh, the work. That he did for the Worldwide Church of God. On the one hand, there's this there's this crazy stuff which really uh, rivals anything you know a lot of the things he did for Mad Magazine and so forth. And then on the other hand, there's the the serious Bible stuff. So I was I was happy that uh, it worked out that way. So that's it the does, story behind that. Okay, well it does, and it does wind up showing a more full flavored uh, yeah uh, the man is a, the man in, a man in full, if you will. Exactly. Uh, to steal the line. Uh, anyway, it, I, it, I, it, it's it's a wonderful thing. I'm going to keep this on my shelf. Uh, it's great to have both types of his work, and uh, uh, I want to tell people that if they uh, if you love the what what you know to be the cartoon madness of Basil Wolverton, you definitely should check out the Wolverton Bible. It packs in both sides of this unique artist, both his drawings of the Old Testament and Book of Revelation, as well as work from Mad Magazine, Plop. Uh, other humorous uh, Worldwide Church of God stuff and uh, just crazy sketches that could only have come from the mind of Basil Wolverton. Uh, the book is available on Amazon.com or at MrMedia.com. You can get it from Fantagraphics.com or pretty much anywhere books are sold. And, of course, to learn more about Basil Wolverton and see more of his work, visit the website, www.wolvertoon.com. That's W-O-L-V-E-R-T-O-O-N. Dot com and Monty, uh, it was uh, delightful to have the opportunity to talk to you and get to know you and learn more about your dad, who's uh, put a smile on my face so many times uh, over these years. And uh, I want to thank you for joining us at Mr. Media today. Thank you, Bob. It was a pleasure. A pleasure, and I uh, hope we'll get to talk again soon. Okay. All right. Take care. Bye. Bye bye. And for uh, more comics-related uh, interviews, surf over to our main site. That's www.mrmedia.com. That's where my conversations with uh, artists as wide and varied as Gene Colan, Trina Robbins, Joe Statton, uh, St- Stefan Pastis, Mark Tatuli, Mort Walker, and many more. And please think about writing an online review of Mr. Media, casting a vote for Mr. Media, or marking Mr. Media as one of your favorites. Whether you listen on Blog Talk Radio, Pointer Online, MySpace, Bebo, High Five, uh, Digital Journal, Podcast Pickle, Vox, Folio, Mediafly, Podfeed.net, Blueberry, Zencast, or Odeo. The point, you can pretty much find Mr. Media anywhere you can find audio on the Internet. Subscribe to Mr. Media on iTunes, and you'll never miss a show. Just search Mr. Media Interviews from within iTunes and subscribe for free. You can also listen with a piece of string and a tin can in many locations. If you've got an idea for a guest, email me directly at bob at andelman.com. That's A-N-D-E-L-M-A-N. You can also follow me on Facebook or on Twitter, www.twitter.com slash andelman. Thanks so much for joining us today. I always appreciate when you give up a little piece of your day to spend it with us. So come on back real soon, everybody. Thanks for listening.